Welcome everybody to episode 83 of Silver Lining for Learning. This one's titled Reimagining the Future of Education and Several Other Simple Ideas. I'm sure this whole show won't be so simple and I hope you have some takeaways from it that you can operationalize. But we have as our guest, Noah Sobi, and he's coming to us from Paris and from UNESCO in Paris. And he's a comparative education researcher at Loyola University in Chicago with his PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison where I went to school a few years before him. So Noah, you want to describe what, it, what the journey is like going from, I think you said you might've been a teacher's college too for your master's, um, going from there to Madison and to Leo and then on, on to, what, what got you to UNESCO? Someone yeah. you know, pulling your, twisting your arm. So tell us about the journey before you show us a few slides. Sure, well, thank you, Kurt. Thank you all. Uh, it's an honor and pleasure to be on, be on the show. Uh, so yes, Noah Sobi, I'm a senior project officer at UNESCO on leave from a faculty position. Um, I mean, I, as I say to my own students, you know, when you, when you tell the story of your life, you can make it all make sense, right? Like this led to that, but at any particular juncture, it seems like that there's many branching points. Um, yeah, I've, uh, you know, taught uh, on the faculty at Loyola for 15 years in the School of Education, um, and then this opportunity to help lead uh, this Futures of Education initiative at UNESCO came up, uh, and I was very fortunate um, to be able to, uh, you know, to be chosen for the position. Um, you know, I'll say a little bit more in a second, but you know, it's it's a uh, it's a kind of once a generation project that UNESCO does um, to study, uh, you know. Um, kind of what, edu what the world of education looks like now, what we foresee for the future. And uh, so I got to come in at, from the very beginning when we were forming an international commission um, and, uh, and then got to support uh, the commission as it did its work, as we brought in lots of expertise. Um, so it definitely pushed me. I think I, I grew as a writer um, and, uh, you know, wherever people can, you know, get get in and out of the academy, um, I think we're all the better for it. So I'm fortunate to be able to have that, have had that opportunity. Was it someone showing you the opportunity? Or did you find it? I mean, honestly, it was just an announcement on a listserv okay. and I threw my, my hat in the ring and that's, okay, and that's okay. how, that's how it happened. Uh, you know, and then as these things go, I discover that I'd worked with someone on something previously. Um, so, uh, UNESCO is, uh, a really wonderful organization and, and interesting because, you know, like a university, it's also a knowledge organization. I mean, it is about, you know, assembling, broadening, um, and putting knowledge to good use, you know, obviously in different ways um, than we do in universities with teaching and learning, but not too far off in, in other ways as well. So. so I assume you're part of a team there. You're, you can, you're not leading... Um, or are you leading a, a large team to, to come up with this report? It's a good, yeah, no, it's, it's a group of us. And then we, uh, we were also backed by expertise across the house, across the education sector. And then, as you know, UNESCO is also very active, you know, in culture, uh, human sciences, um, uh, also in, you know, communication and information. Um, so it was a whole team across UNESCO. But honestly, we also drew in um, a lot of expertise um, kind of from around the world, from different circles. Uh, you know, if you go on the Futures of Education website, which I hope we can put in, in the feed at some point, uh, uh, I think we've done a pretty good job of showing all the things that contributed to the ideas uh, that the commission was working with. Uh, the commission itself, you know, chaired by the president of Ethiopia uh, and had 19 meetings over the past two years. Uh, and now we've, we've, we've produced this report, you know, reimagining our futures together, a new social contract for education. Um, Hold it, which, up Hold it up higher. Hold it up higher. Yeah, this is a this is a flyer version okay. of it, but uh, yeah. So why don't you show, why don't you show us a few slides in the video, and then we'll come back and we'll start asking you some questions about it. And Punya, can you put in the in the YouTube chat window the the futures of of uh, education link for for future of learning link? Great, thanks. So I'm going to share. Um, 
First, I'm going to show a quick uh, two minute video that sets some of the context um, for the initiative um, and uh, a little bit on how, it, how, how the report came together. The futures of humanity and our living planet are at risk. We are at a turning point. Urgent action is needed to change course and transform the future. Everyone alive today has a tremendous obligation to future generations to ensure that their world is one of human rights, abundance and not scarcity. Education is one of the key ways we address inequality, exclusion and work on healing our damaged planet. But to transform the world, education needs to be transformed. UNESCO launched its Futures of Education initiative to bring the world together to reimagine how education can shape the future. Despite the urgency of action and in conditions of great uncertainty, we have reason to be full of hope. Education can help us make a peaceful, just and sustainable world. For this, we need to renew education by asking what that we do now should be continued, what should be abandoned and what needs to be invented afresh. A new social contract for education needs to be built. Collectively, we must strengthen education as a global common good. Let's all work together in our communities and across the world to ensure that education best supports our shared futures. So uh, let me now see if I can um without breaking the screen share. Um, just take you quickly through um, a couple of slides that, that go into somewhat more depth on this. Um, and, you know, Kurt, cut me off if I go too long. I'm trying to just be three or four minutes. Um, but uh, I want to explain that, you know, the overarching argument of the report is that the world is at a turning point. I think this is something many of us are acutely aware of, that we face a choice. We can continue on a, uh, you know, a pretty unsustainable path or we can radically change. Um, for that, we know that education uh, is one of the most uh, important features of societal transformation um, and for renewal. Um, and, to have education do what we need it to do for us at this moment, uh, we need to rethink how we do education. We need to rethink the social contract for education um, so that it can repair past injustices while at the same time uh, transforming and shaping uh, futures that are just, peaceful, and sustainable. Uh, <clears throat> the report uh, that's the centerpiece of the project, um, although as you'll see, uh, is really just a starting point, uh, was put together by a panel of think thought leaders um, from around the planet, headed by Her Excellency, the President of Ethiopia. Uh, but just as importantly, it drew on uh, input from over a million people um, who offered their ideas through surveys, by participating in webinars, um, also uh, by providing written input, um, and uh, even artwork. Um, just to give you a sense of the, the richness of that input, uh, last March, we put out a progress update. It was just a 7,000 word document for input. Um, Kurt, I think that you and I actually emailed on that. Um, uh, we put out a 7,000 word progress update and we got 93,000 words of comments on it. Um, which is just an amazing ratio. Uh, so I would say this has also been, you, 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 you asked me what it's like to kind of go from academia to working for UNESCO. This has been one of the most intense peer review processes I, I've been involved with in my life. Um, 
Uh, it follows in a tradition of uh, conducting landmark analyses at key moments. Uh, you know, the first of these uh, took, took place in the early 1970s under the leadership of Edgar Farr, le led to the Learning to Be Report, published 1972, uh, which arguably put the notion of lifelong learning on the international education agenda. Some of you uh, and some of you listening may be more familiar with the Delore Report from the mid-90s, uh, Learning the Treasure Within, uh, which laid out the notion of, of, of the four pillars, uh, and also you know, very much in keeping with the current report and UNESCO's overall uh, mission laid out a, a humanistic vision of education. Um, and now we arrive uh, to 2021 um, and the reimagining our futures together, a new social contract for education. Uh, really quickly, um, I just, you know, kind of high level uh, takeaways from the report um, are that, you know, we, we really know if we, if we take the time to be honest about it, that, that more doing more of the same, even if, even if we do it more efficiently, um, is heading us towards a cliff. I think that's true, clearly true in the case of climate and the environment, but I also think it's, it's very much true, uh, in the case of, you know, how we live together, um, uh, we need to do a lot um, to avert some of the catastrophes that are right in front of us. So what the report counters with is an argument that we need to think about rebalancing our relationships with each other, with the living planet, and with technology. And uh, one of the key ways we need to do that is in and through education. Uh, education, however, um, and I don't think I need to convince you, um, is far from perfect and needs a lot of fixing. I mean, the way we organize education, particularly on a global level, um, really doesn't do enough. Uh, and in fact, some of the ways that we set up education actually do us harm. Um, so the proposal is for a, a reworking, a rethinking, a new social contract for education that I said, at, as I said at the outset, um, has both a kind of present and past regarding um, dimension and a future regarding dimension. Uh, you know, this is something that everyone who's around now, uh, and obviously I'm echoing something everyone will be familiar with from the, the COP meetings in Glasgow, you know, we all have an obligation, uh, not just to the future, but to the present, to people living today, um, to really take some action to ensure um, that our, our world uh, becomes or remains one of abundance and not scarcity. And, and here, you know, we have to give children and youth uh, a, key, a key role. You know, they, their actions are rehearsals for a different kind of future. Uh, quickly, um, you know, the, one of the issues that I think all of us need to confront in education Education, and this is clear in the commission's report, um, that uh, education is not a panacea. In fact, um, you know, uh, there are ideas um, that we put forth in some of our educational systems and institutions that are really propelling us uh, in, in uh, unsustainable directions. Uh, the report gives considerable attention to technology, um, clearly a valuable tool, um, not used as well, um, as equitably, as justly as it could be. A tremendous lost opportunity is one of the arguments of the report. And in this regard, the report makes the recommendation that education should not just follow technological change, but needs to play a role in steering technological advancement. Uh, and that one of the things we should be doing in curricula, in educational institutions, is supporting students to act on technology, not just use it, but act on it and determine how it's used for what purposes. Uh, uh, and then a, a final kind of high level uh, argument put forth in the report um, a re, uh, uh, circles around the notion of education as a common good, even a global common good. Um, and an argument that uh, the commercialization, we cannot permit education to become solely a market good um, as we see ways that that is really impeding on the achievement of, of an equitable education for all. Um, and the commission makes a strong case uh, of, of the need to support public education, 
uh, which is taken as meaning education that occurs in a public space that promotes public interests and is accountable um, to all. Uh, so to accomplish this, uh, the commission puts out the notion of renewal. Um, so not just to abandon and start again, but by begin by asking, what do we do now that we should continue? What should we abandon? And what do we need to rethink and, 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 and re reinvent? Uh, and I think those, those three questions are key questions for, um, for all of us. They're worth asking. Um, you know, in education institutions and in policy settings. Uh, just quickly to end with two things, you know, the idea of a social contract for education um, is to think about the ways that probably less transactionally, but relationally, the ways, the values that are at the core of, of education uh, systems, the design principles, how we set up uh, institutions, and then who, who has a role in, in, uh, uh, in education and making educational decisions. Um, for foundational commitments, uh, the report puts forth a strong argument, uh, you know, a rights-based argument, and also an argument for strengthening education as a public endeavor, as a common good. And then for, uh, in terms of the design of education systems, um, you know, the report starts from the idea that the current social contract for education was organized at a very different moment in time um, when education efforts were largely focused on uh, national development and citizenship. Um, and I mean, I think this idea that uh, instead um, education needs to help us focus on our common challenges is maybe a, a kind of central point. Uh, and then this is more to carefully declined in the report. I won't go into detail, we can in the discussion, but in terms of co uh, pedagogy, there's a call, call for collaboration, cooperation, solidarity for curricula, um, a focus, uh, a, a suggestion to move away from thinking of curricula as a, as a grid of subjects to thinking more about ecological intercultural, interdisciplinary learning, you know, to, to really think about teaching um, and further move teaching in the direction of being a collaborative endeavor. Um, around schools, the commission uh, takes a position um, that I think makes a heck of a lot of sense, although some people say, wait, can you have both? I think you definitely can. It's one to say, you know, if the school didn't exist, we'd need to invent it. I mean, we, we, the school's a valuable institution, but that doesn't mean we need to accept all schools the way they are now. So the argument is that the school needs to be safeguarded, protected, and transformed. And then finally, that we need to think uh, and kind of expand the way we think about education um, and welcome uh, educational opportunities in all times and spaces. So I'll close with that. Um, uh, understanding I'll have the chance to, to talk more and looking forward to the, uh, to the conversation. And if it's okay, Kurt, I'm gonna stop the share. Yeah, please, please, yeah. And then we'll get all this back on. And, and I've got a few questions. I'm sure Young has a few questions and Punya probably has a few, but we're gonna start with Chris. Chris, you wanna jump in here? Yeah, so I, I wanna make clear at the uh, onset that I like the report. Uh, I think it's a worthy endeavor. As you did the summary, there was no point that you made that I didn't agree with. But my forecast is that the impact of this report will be minimal. And I say that because over the last five to 10 years, there have been many similar reports that all said fundamentally the same thing. They said, here's why we need to change. And they made all the good arguments for that. Here's what we need to change to, and they made all the good arguments for that. And then nothing happened. And in fact, uh, all, if there are in fact multiple universes with different futures, I believe that if I had a time machine and I went to the universe that had the best possible 2040 future for education worldwide, and I studied it in detail and I came back to the present and I wrote a 9,000 page report that roll by roll, year by year in the entire global education system told people what to do in order to get to that future in 2040, that that wouldn't have any impact. I don't think the problem is that we 
don't know that there's a problem, although there are many people who don't know there's a problem, but they're not going to be convinced by another report. And I don't think the problem is that we don't know what to do. In fact, the whole problem is that we don't implement what we know to do. So I'm, I'm wondering first whether you would agree that this is a first step rather than a place to stop. And second, if you see some kind of how do we do this action coming out of the report or coming out of some other kind of initiative that might actually get us off the dime in terms of making change. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Chris. Appreciate that. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a problem that I think keeps us all up at night, right? Um, I, I, I would say that um, this report, I think, is somewhat significantly different from some of the other futures of education literature. And of course, we did a lot of kind of you know high horizon scanning of that literature and, and study of it. Um, Maybe right now I'll just mention I'll mention two things. One is that as you've caught and made mention of, um, uh, the UNESCO project uses futures in the plural. Um, you know, it recognizes that we share a planet, um, that we have a common destiny, but that destiny is going to, and particularly education in the world of the future, is going to take different forms in different places with different people. You know, that's why the foundational commitments are so important. Those, uh, you know, the UNESCO and the commission is arguing need to be respected, you know, uh, human rights, you know, a commitment to the common good. Um, but then we, we, another key part of, um, you know, I think the organization for sure, but a, a lot of people working in education is a commitment to, um, you know, understanding that the world and, and welcoming that the world is one that has, you know, multiple ways of, of knowing and, and, and being in it. And that variety, frankly, is valuable to all of us. Um, <clears throat> so that's what the futures is capturing. And I think that uh, a lot of the other reports out there um, really envision the future of education from one perspective and kind of map it onto the rest of the planet. Um, and that's, I think, something to be avoided and something we're trying to avoid here. The second uh, relates to that is I think a lot of the Ed Futures work uh, is really, um, you know, a little too futuristic. I mean, uh, you know, both kind of the, the, the dystopian uh, and the utopian scenarios. Uh, I mean, there is a dangerous tendency, I would say it's a dangerous tendency out there, you know, uh, to think that, you know, technological advancements will solve all of our problems. I mean, let's hope they solve a lot of them because uh, we got a lot of things to solve. But that sort of faith in technological solutionism um, I think, uh, you know, needs to be, needs to be joined um, with a whole lot of other things. Uh, and I think that's one reason why this report is maybe a bit different because it is realistic. It says, you know, we can't ignore um, the unfulfilled promises of the past. Um, you know, we can't just hope that we get to this, you know, utop nirvana utopia. Uh, and it's going to be, it's going to be, uh, take a lot of work um, to do that. So how do we do that work? Uh, you know, the report's not a blueprint. Um, it's an invitation for di ongoing dialogue, research, and action. Um, you know, we had a million people offering the ideas, and clearly it's going to take millions more to take this forward. Um, you know, the education community is one of the key uh, vehicles for that, but uh, governments, the member states of UNESCO, are also, uh, you know, receiving this report, and so far the reception's been, uh, been very positive. Uh, you know what? Um, can I and, stop, yep. stop you on that point? Please. And, and go back to Krista. We have a lot of questions for you. Chris, you want to you have a follow-up? Or comment. Oh, I just want to say that, that thank you for your answer. It helps to clarify how it's different than the other reports. And I, I look forward to the questions my co-hosts have. We'll be back with Chris, I'm sure, with a follow-up. Uh, Dave, just a quick more. quick yeah. follow-up comment. I one thing that I do appreciate uh, the work, you know, like when we talk about it, we always talk about the work we do as learning future. So that emphasis on the plural, I think <clears throat> is really important. Um, to acknowledge that that just given the, the diversity within this planet to expect that there is going to be one answer that's going to work across the board 
Uh, so I do appreciate that. I just wanted to make that comment. Of course, Chris has authored many reports on the future of education. So he's got a, a different a, a, um, a different perspective maybe than than those of us who haven't written one. Um, I hope to I hope to be in your shoes one day and, and get involved in something like this. So uh, Young's got got a follow up question. So Young, uh, thanks, Noah. Uh, that, that's uh, that's nice to to see uh, the report. I think um, Chris is right. In, in essence, I agree with everything. You guys have in there. I, I can, you know, I, I really like it. So there are really a, a, a bunch of things I want to throw out there. Number one is um, I was surprised uh, you still uh, you did not really place children or students as the lead of their learning. In the beginning, you take, you know, the actions of the youth could be rehearsals of the futures. So I think today, if you look in many, many countries, developing and developed countries, schools are suppressing the students with a curriculum. In many ways, and you have to study this, you have to you know, take this test, this exam. So, so the role of the learner, the role of the individuals, especially in poor areas, you know, uh, and how, what role can they take to drive their own education? The second um, point I was, I was going interested in is I like the, you know, you talk about curriculum, ecological, intercultural, you know, all those things is, is, is interesting. But at the same time, how does it become global? I think schools, one of the big problems with today's education is schools are isolated. You know, if you're in Massachusetts, you have a Massachusetts school. I mean, you're, you're from Chicago, you know, the CPS schools, they're very much isolated. You know, when we when COVID has forced teachers to go online so, and schools to do remote learning, but their education is still very limited, controlled within that school. And that's where I think uh, uh, technology could do that students-driven curriculum or personalized curriculum, how they can connect. And a final point I was really interested in is, uh, yes, technology can be good and bad. Technology is always bad. Technology is always, we can, we can debate about that. Uh, I, I think the, uh, a big piece today for a lot of developing countries, uh, I think UNESCO has a lot of influence for developing countries, uh, is, uh, is connect these children beyond their immediate environments. That was, and so how can we drive that? So I'm actually hoping an education future is to redefine the role of teachers. So the learning of students are not always controlled by teachers, curriculum or system. But UNESCO of course works with the governments and I'm always suspicious of a governments. Anyway, so I just like to say here, uh, your, your re reactions to what I was saying. Thanks. Thanks, Young. There's a lot of great points in there. Um, maybe just on um, the role of learners. Um, you know, there is uh, there is a strong emphasis in the report on teaching, on thinking about education. Um, so by which we mean the the ways that that, that both learning and teaching are organized, uh, the variety of ways that learning and teaching are organized across the human lifespan. Um, you know, thinking about not just, um, thinking about that as an intergenerational conversation. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the key ways that, um, you know, the world changes as people, you know, take ideas and rework them. Um, and I mean, we think we see this in our own lives. We see this, we see this going on. But uh, I, I would say we, we shouldn't discount the importance of teaching. Um, you know, I appreciate, absolutely appreciate your point um, that uh, there are certainly systems that need to be more learner driven. And I think you'll find the report open to that. Um, but uh, the effort is definitely to, to chart a course. Um, where uh, adults and educators play an important role using education institutions to move children beyond their immediate environments, to expose them to other possibilities. Um, I think that's what education can really, one of the things education can really valuably do. And I mean, just to sort of tie in a small comment on technology, um, 
I mean, I agree uh, generally with what you said, Young. Um, you know, one of the the important points made in the in in the commission's report is that uh, you know one of the most powerful things technology can do in education is connect people. You know, it can it can allow for this expansion of horizons. Um, you know, in ways that were not available to us previously. Okay, um, we've got a, a active chat. Uh, thank you, everyone who's in the chat window, uh, and I've posted the links to the report there, so they'll be able to explore all the things you've talked about and all the things that are in our blog post related to this session. Um, because all, we have these people in, in that are that have come to the session, I want to ask a question about the skills and experiences that got you um, hired. Uh, to, to, because people might be interested in what kinds of experiences do they need to prepare themselves for uh, an endeavor like this. A doctoral student, a former doctoral student of mine, Hessa Alangari in Riyadh, has put, posted a question for us here. And she sent me an email before the show saying, I'm setting my alarm to make sure I'm up. Uh, it's not too late in Riyadh, actually, but she, she wants to know uh, what life is like at UNESCO, um, what it's like putting a report together, because we're seeing a final report, but there's a lot of sweat uh, and man hours and, and things that we don't see in such reports, you know? And so I, I think we've got Dadzi Amadoto from Ottawa here. We've got uh, um, uh, Edgar Gonzalez from the International Development Bank and Therese, who passed her qualifying exam yesterday from Granada. They've also asked similar questions in the in the chat. So what what kind of skills and experiences does one, you know, maybe need to equip themselves for such an international post? Um, many of my students say, I want to work at the World Bank. I want to work at UNESCO. I want to work, you know, so and so, you know, uh, the Commonwealth of Learning with Sanjay Mishra. Um, you know, what does it take? Um, can you can you describe the this your background a little bit that led to sure this. yeah what I'm, it's like uh, putting a report together like this for sure I mean I, I'm happy to I want to keep the focus on the report but um, you know I would say that uh, I mean there are many different routes that people take into working in these organizations I took the route of of uh, you know having a career uh, as a researcher as a comparative education researcher. Um, I have uh, training as a historian of education. Um, so sometimes people will ask me, well, what's a historian doing working on the future? My answer to that is that we, <laughs> I would actually submit that, you know, historians maybe, you know, more than other people are primed to uh, be aware of a world that that was different and could be different. And uh, I think that kind of thinking and approach is open to lots of people. Um, so that kind of awareness of, of, of possibility, uh, I think is something that um, uh, is valuable for anyone. I mean, honestly, strong analytic skills, strong research skills are, are things that, um, you know, people coming to organizations like this, you know, uh, from an academic background can really bring uh, and put forward. You know, there are other people that come into international organizations, you know, with strong project management uh, backgrounds. And that's also something that an organization like the bank or, or your UNESCO um, vitally needs. So Hessa does have a question. I'll go, Young will be, have the follow-up to this, but Hessa asks a question. How can we as educators initiate some of these global intercultural communities of practice for educational technology? Um, for educational, I mean, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, in different areas and different subjects, you know, there are, uh, you know, world level associations. I encourage people to, uh, I always encourage people to go to conferences. This has gotten easier uh, now that, you know, COVID has uh, make, made us realize both the advantages of convening in person uh, and the affordances of convening um, virtual or in these hybrid, in these hybrid ways. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, the extent to which you can like extend your professional networks um, by getting involved in the professional associations, whether that's social studies instruction or even math instruction, um, you know, uh, at, at a national level and at an international level are definitely, definitely worth, worth, worth pursuing. Um, yeah. So we'll go to Young next. Young. 
So, so Noah, uh, feel free not to answer uh, my question because this might be kind of a dangerous conversation. Uh, but I, so, so you know, UNESCO, you know, apparently is working for with the UN with so many different governments. But I'm sure you are quite aware. Uh, in many countries, education is not education; it's just brainwashing. You know, in, in many cases, so you just have dictatorship kind of education. And but you you have to accept uh, you know the, the fact right now they're doing what they're doing. You have the dictator, you have the governments, you know. So so I was just wondering, it's kind of follow up up to Kurt's question. When when your panel uh, work on this, uh, do you get any active resistance or people say just well I just ignore it? It's it's just a report. It doesn't happen. Or do you guys debate about this? You know, like you know, how do we? have a free education that really liberates people, pushes people to the future so they can build a better future. And so I was just curious about that part to get a lot of political influence in, you know, again, any education right now is run by governments, by different systems, you know, the true education. So how does that affect your work or the report yeah. or at all, you know? Yeah, you know, I, I, I appreciate the question. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, I know we all know there are there are very indoctrinating forms of education, um, but I think that one of the beautiful things about teaching and learning is that it's never certain. There's always an element of risk and chance uh, and openness in any kind of human educational interchange. Um, you know. Uh, I think we can all point to lots of examples. Uh, I mean, let's just take you know the 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 transition um, from you know communist regimes, uh, you know, in Eastern Central Europe. You know, uh, all of a sudden people were making choices. Where did that come about? Well, they came about because the education systems weren't as total and indoctrinating as some researchers thought they were. Um, you know, the second thing is, yeah, I mean, we, there's clearly this is going to be picked up and used differently in different parts of the world. Um, you know, it aligns very strongly with, um, you know, key commitments in, um, you know, the Uni Universal Declaration of, uh, of Human Rights. Um, UNESCO has a, a series of programs promoting the freedom of journalists, um, the free exchange of information. And you know that translates in the education sector into a real commitment to academic freedom, um, and that's something that that is definitely uh, emphasized um, strongly in this report. But by the way, uh, Noah, is it true that uh, this report should not come to the U.S. because U.S. is not a member? The U.S. has <laughs> no input in, on this, right? Uh, you're right that the United States is not currently. Uh, let's emphasize currently uh, a member of UNESCO. Um, uh, but uh, I mean, certainly, um, uh, you know, it would be in the interests of the United States uh, to, to rejoin UNESCO uh, and kind of rejoin the international community in this way. Um, but yeah, was there was there input into the report from 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 the United States from well, US you are from scholars? The US, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but uh, I guess the final thing I should say um, uh, to emphasize is that is that this is a report from an independent international commission. Um, so uh, you know this is something that is then received by UNESCO and 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 taken up um, as the organization as its and its member states uh, see fit. So Punya is going to jump in here. Punya. Sure. So, um, you know, I had sort of a similar question to what Chris asked, and then Zhao chimed in with his point. And I was like, you know, something, I mean, this is what academics do. We, we always take this critical stance. So I'm going to take a slightly different tack. And I'm going to say that what personally I appreciate is the fact that at least there is this attempt. I mean, we live the fact that we live in this on this planet where we are deeply interconnected has never been more real, right? And unless we engage in these kinds of conversations, and trust me, I come at it as pessimistically, let's say, as Chris, you know, framed it in the beginning. However, um, let us not also under 
estimate the value of having these conversations. Um, of at least given all the points that Zhao raised, which is that different countries see education differently, that there is this indoctrination. I mean, you know, um, Zhao and I, you know, Zhao comes from China, I come from India, and we are looking at, at least in India, huge battles over sort of what the history of India is and what the curriculum should be, right? Um, so all of those things are, of course, playing out, right? Um, however, the fact that we can at least come together either in online forum or face-to-face -face in Paris or wherever it may be to have these conversations. And yes, they're frustrating and you know action and all that sort of stuff. I agree with all of that, but I don't think that we have any other choice. There is no other way that I can think of, of moving forward anyway, right? And so let's, let's you know, uh, acknowledge that fact. Um, yeah. So thank you for your work on that, right? I mean, but question for me is as follow, is that follows from this is, all right, so we have this report, we got all these people together, we got put our heads together, um, and this is what we have. So how does UNESCO or other organizations then see what the next steps are? Because you know, all change that's gonna happen is gonna be local, we know that, right? Uh, so we can collectively as a species agree on these broad frames and ideas. I, and there will still be people who will disagree with certain points of it, that's fine. But what, what are the next, how does, the what is sort of the action plan so what kinds of ways would this be implemented or brought into action i mean what is the plan there now that the report is done great thank you uh, i mean just quickly to agree with you i mean I, I don't think we have a choice but to have some hope um you know uh and you know full agreement that you know we are the Togetherness, the fact that we're together on this planet is, is a fact, um, not an aspiration. What we need to aspire to do is to work together better. That remains an aspiration and something to be accomplished. And I think education is one of the key ways we can, we can, we can work in that direction. Uh, so on, on, on two levels, first of all, uh, you know, this report is out there. Uh, for people to argue with, to improve upon, um, to make meaningful in their settings. Um, we hope it will be a valuable reference point uh, in discussions in multiple places. It's a, it's a global report. It is intended um, to uh, you know, speak broadly, be relevant broadly, uh, but at the same time, it recognizes that there needs to be a, a regionalization, a localization uh, of, of the proposals, um, because as you said, Punya, very well, I mean, education is, is, is extremely local, um, and so the report recognizes that. Uh, so one is, this is out in the public uh, domain for uh, people to, you know, consume and hack and rework. Uh, UNESCO specifically, um, you know, is uh, uh, kind of advancing, uh, you know, supporting the dialogue that we hope this will will advance. Um, you know, we we're trying to we're we're launching a campaign um, to have people ask those same three questions that the commission asked of their schools. We think this is a really useful way um, to work on making change, to ask, you know, what do we do in this, in our university and education, our community that should continue? What should we stop doing? Uh, what needs to be reinvented? But then a fourth question, and how do we do that? Right. Um, so we're launching. We're launching that campaign. Uh, we're also going to be working. I think the report has a lot to say about changing how uh, you know teaching and learning. Um, but those conversations, I think, can usefully examine advance at a regional, sub-regional level. Uh, and then there's a third dimension of research. You know, I think that the the the, the report uh, has a lot to offer the research community. Uh, it does call for a, a global collective research uh, uh, endeavor uh, oriented around the right to education. Um, it is as part of that. It calls for um, you know, uh, if you will, if you will, like a decolonization of some of the research methodologies that are typically used, um, uh, uh, you know, 
asking us all to move in directions of, of, of being um, open and understanding and, and, and basing on different kinds of voices that many voices that have been excluded from those conversations. Um, you know, one of the pieces that uh, I think is really worth uh, moving forward is uh, what the report uh, talks about in terms of the knowledge commons, you know, kind of the shared intellectual resources of a humanity, which, which of course have never been, you know, have neither been, you know, completely open to all, nor have they accepted all ideas. Um, so I think there's work ahead of us, um, you know, both to make the knowledge commons accessible, um, but also to make um, make it a two way street so people can contribute to the knowledge commons. So in my vision, like, you know, we would be really successful if at the end of the day, you know, more and more kids are learning in more and more schools you know, both how to get knowledge and create knowledge. So, no, I'm going to stop you there. You were stopping anyways, because um, this is a conversation and Chris is going to add to this conversation. Chris. So I, I didn't express myself well earlier. If, if the impression left is that I'm pessimistic about the future of education, I'm optimistic about it. I'm still you know, a professor and working away every Saturday, I come to Silver Lining for learning. But what I am pessimistic about is top down approaches to the future of education. And that's what I was trying to convey anybody's top down approaches. Um, I don't believe that given a detailed blueprint for a better future that people won't necessarily execute it, especially if it's a blueprint that comes from a commission any commission, including a Harvard commission. So what's the alternative? I think there is an alternative. I wouldn't agree with Punya. I think the alternative is what my late colleague, Clay Christensen, talked about as disruption. That uh, the report really calls for kind of a midpoint between evolutionary approaches and transformational approaches, which I understand, and these are all complementary strategies for change uh, that probably work best when all three of them are used. But Silver Lining for Learning is actually about disruption. Silver Lining for Learning in many of the episodes are about people who small scale are doing something really different that we believe is scalable. And we talk to them about how it might scale and we talk to the audience about how others might be able to adapt it to their own place and time. And I, I believe that at this point, what would be more productive would be to put resources behind things like silver lining for learning. I'm not starting a fund drive here for us, but disruptive, encouraging people to start small and invent new models that work for their own communities, designing for scale, and then publicizing what they're doing and inviting others to adapt. I just think that that's got a much better chance of success than the top-down approach. Uh, sorry, Noah, before you say anything, I got to really highlight what Chris said. A Harvard commission doesn't work and a silver lining works. Okay, so go for that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> no, I, I just want to make a quick comment, Chris, and I, I agree with you, and I'm sorry if I came uh, sort of appear to misrepresent your position. That said, the only point I would make is, I think both of these have to coexist. I think that these kinds of national level conversations, however, and no, I don't even know how much headbutting you might have had to do, which I'm sure you cannot publicly talk about, but I know this is a challenge. It's a complicated process and it's a negotiation, which means, you know, it, it, there will be components of it which you may not 100% agree with or nobody on the committee 100%. I get that. But I think that both of these have to happen. I completely believe in the point, Chris, you are making that. And that's, I think, the point I was making at the local level, the innovation that are going to happen are going to be deeply contextual, are going to be local. And they are not going to scale in the same way that the industrial model of education scale necessarily. But I think they can inspire. There are ideas that can transfer and translate. And I think that's what sort of silver line does and I think that's what I think is really important but I just want to highlight the, that that you know it is um, it's it's both have to happen and I think that this is an important part of us as a species trying to contend with it while we are also working at the local uh, level and context and you know innovations are happening there 
I mean, I think you've, you've all put it very well. I, I, I mean, one of the dangers is when we do look for magic bullet solutions. And, and, and that's, I mean, that's something that, uh, you know, we've had to, uh, to contend with a bit in the preparation of this report. I mean, it is very clear that it is not a blueprint. Now, um, I, I can tell you, uh, I'm not revealing anything to say that there are people who wish it were a blueprint. Um, but I think that's, you know, you know, an impossibility and, 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 and not even desirable if it were possible. Um, uh, and I'm, I think the commission, the spirit of the report is fully on board with local initiatives, you know, being taken forward, being scaled, being rescaled in other places. Um, however, I would just say that, you know, that doesn't mean that we can't also mobilize at a larger level. You know, I mean, one thing that's amazing about, you know, the, the, the birth of the modern school, you use, you know, the industrial school model, you know, is that it brought together, uh, you know, medical medicine, it brought together architects, it brought together, um, you know, social services, uh, you know, it brought together, you know, ideas about citizenship and national belonging. I mean, it was, it was a massive, there was a massive mobilization to produce the school, the schools, the schooling models that we live with today. And we need to change those models, but I think we need a similar mass mobilization of, of people to really, like one of the things we absolutely need to do is just make the point over and over again, how important education is, right? And it, it just, I mean, we, we have to act in a small town, in a small school, but we have to make that point, you know, at a national level, across regions, internationally, globally. So Noah, we haven't talked about metrics and impact. And I'm sure you have in producing this report thought about, and you probably looked at previous reports and what they did in terms of metrics. But, but impact doesn't have to be on a global or national scale. It can be on an individual scale. Uh, back in 1988, I think it was, I read Chris's AI in education and his very long report made a big impact on me. I read his report, I think, The Future of Education. And there were two reports, two things you had, around 1988, Chris, or 87, 89, they're real thick. And then I went to see Chris in uh, San Diego give a summer institute for AERA. And uh, that was also impactful, that, that one thing led to another. Um, so this report could lead people to do other things. You might not notice it immediately, but then, then his impact, that impact of those, both those reports ended up in my, a class I'm doing, I'm still doing 30 years later, uh, it's, it was a different title, but on emerging learning technologies, that's the title now, it wasn't the title back then. But there's a third report he did on the future of death station, which is much shorter <laughs> in nature. All three of them ended up in that first class syllabus, I remember. So the impact, and I'm sure many people have your report in their syllabi, and they'll have debates, they'll have conversations about it in their classes, just like I had conversations about Chris's reports in, in my early class of that particular course. And then that leads people to cite that and, and, and put it in their book chapters and so forth. So you might not know the, the various ways and this, this report will impact people. It just, you know, there's various people in the, in the YouTube channel that are reading this report now and gonna share it with their colleagues and, and have a conversation about it. I know Hess is talking about dramatic changes in Riyadh happening right now. They have to make some critical decisions and she has to, try and attend every session like this to try and ramp up uh, and understand what the future of learning is like so they can make huge changes in Riyadh. Um, no small thing, she's at Princess Nora University. So you wanna talk about the ways of impact that are maybe obvious and, and explicit and maybe some of those that might be more subtle and, uh, and, and informal in nature. Well, Kurt, I think you've just given us a nice description of you know, how to think about, and that's very much, how, you know, one of the tracks on which we're thinking about the impact of this, that it becomes a reference document, that it becomes something that's used in teacher education, that's used in educational studies, that's um, a, a useful thing for people in all, a lot of different settings kind of to think with. Um, you know, that thinking together is a key part of acting together. Um, and hopefully this report contributes there. Uh, you know, maybe another way that, um, 
uh, I mean, obviously we'll check, we'll track the citations and so forth. Um, but I think more important is, you know, more important than the downloads are like, if you will, the uploads. So, I mean, I used the example earlier of a 7,000 word progress document that could 92, no, sorry, 93,000 words of comment on it. Uh, to me, that's the right, that's the, the kind of ratio, the right direction to be heading. You know, we want people to take this report and do things with it. Um, you know, that can be hard to track, um, but that's really at the end of the day, the goal. So uh, we have a couple more minutes. Does anyone have a, a I have a final question, but does anyone want to jump in here before I do? I, I just want to jump in. So I just want to play with your idea, Kurt. I don't think, you know, it, okay, don't take this too seriously. Uh, uh, you know, when Noah's saying that downloading, uploading, students read this, I don't think those are real impact. I mean, honestly, uh, that, a lot of people come in, you read this, you, you do this. I'm actually was really interested in the impact on governments and, uh, you know, on the people who are taking actions. Because, you know, uh, reading these ideas that like Chris said, if you are within one type of education thinking, you've read this, you've seen this stuff like, like this, you know. So, so I'm actually very interested in to say, I guess this goes probably to Punia's, you know, thought, you know, are there any countries, members of UNESCO plan seriously to say, we will follow this and we will try something you know, to, to implement something. I was just want, curious about that, you know. Me I having people read it, it's, it's yeah, it's okay. I, I'm not, dis, by the way, I'm not discounting any of those things, but they're just not near as important because in five, 10 years, you'll get another report. Someone else is gonna write another one, you know, that, that's just, then they're gonna cite again, you know. So what, you know, so what, what, what's, the, what's the government reaction to this, Noah, so far? I mean, so far it's very positive. Uh, we had 40 heads of state here at UNESCO yesterday um, because uh, we're celebrating the 75th anniversary of the organization. There was a, a big event, uh, not to mention a ministerial conference with uh, somewhere between 40 and 50 ministers of education from countries around the world. So, you know, as you point out, uh, Young, like that's one of the amazing things an organization like this can do is, you know, get these ideas in the hands of government to take forward. Um, and so far, yes, absolutely. The reception's been, been, been very positive. Um, and, and, and the UNESCO member states were involved in the process along the way. Um, it is an independent international commission, um, but they contributed, you know, alongside um, you know, school kids from schools all over the world um, and all of that enriched, enriched the piece. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like we should have a follow-up show in, in, no, in a year I, or so. I really want to thank you, Noah. You know, just uh, uh, Chris and Puni, our questions here are really trying to drive efforts like this forward to say, how do we make a difference? You know, what, what can happen? So I, I just want to... Thank you for, for coming along, for sharing these ideas with us. Kurt. Puni has a final comment and I have a final question. Oh, then no, then go with your question. My comment is not related to the episode. No, go go ahead. Uh, oh, uh, go ahead, Puni. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. So, so um, Noah, What's next? I mean, are you going to are you, are you going to come back to Chicago, Loyola, Cincinnati? Back to the plow. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I I'm very fortunate to be able to stay uh, through through uh, next summer. I'm going to help um, with the rollout and all the follow on activities. One thing that's super exciting, uh, getting exactly to what you were saying, Young, about the uptake of this, is that this report is uh, is going to be foundational document for. Uh, a transforming education summit that the UN Secretary General is organizing in September of uh, 2022. Um, so we know that at least within the UN system, uh, it's going to be an important document um, to help move conversations forward. Um, so I'm privileged to be able to be continue to be part of that. Uh, and then I will go back to my teaching. Yes. And Noah's emails in the blog post. So if you're interested in writing to him, you can take take a look at the blog post and send him an email of questions because we didn't get a chance to ask all the questions in the in the YouTube chat. And we're appreciative of the people who came this week. Please come next week as well. Punya, your your final comment, Punya? 
Yes. So first, Noah, thank you. Um, as I said, before the show started, uh, we'll be in touch for some of the work that we're doing here uh, to get you on board, you know, help us with that. Um, I think the, the point, we don't have a show next week um, because of Thanksgiving. So that's just to let everybody know that's on the website as well. But I just wanted to make a point that um, you know, this is, I think Thanksgiving, weirdly enough, and I didn't grow up in the US, but Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday of the year. And I think it's got to do with that word thanks. And it's got to do with an opportunity to be with friends and family. Um, so I just wanted to make just to all of you, uh, Noah, to have met you today and to Chris and Zhao and Kurt, uh, how grateful I am for your collegiality, your friendship. Um, how grateful I am for the privileges that I have that I get to do something like this. Um, and just undeservingly, I have been given a lot of riches and I'm very grateful for that. And I wish uh, everybody a wonderful Thanksgiving break and we will see you in two weeks time. Thank you, Punya. Don't kill a turkey. Okay. Oh, I'm vegetarian now. So. All right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all for having me.